Well, hello. Welcome back to Digital Charcuterie. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Thanks so much for coming back here as we continue talking about DC Superheroes United and the campaign that's got everybody a tingling with excitement. There's a lot to do, so we're just going to rush past all the YouTube stuff. Buy my book, subscribe, all that. You know, you know how it goes. Uh, let's just jump right into what has happened and what's new on the DC docket. So first of all, the other night, they announced this complete surprise, a painting compendium for DC Superheroes United. This is a full hardcover book with insane details about how to paint these characters if you want to try to give them the best paint job you can. And these are done by the people from Big Child Creative, so you know you're in good hands. They're only showing off the Wonder Woman parts of it, uh, but it looks like here you can see uh, it's tricky because it's kind of small, but they lay out all the colors for you and what layers to put on from the bases to the skin and whatnot. It looks like they go into a lot of detail. I am not a painter. I definitely cannot afford to be a painter because paints cost money. So this is definitely not something that's for me, but I know tons of people would love this. So I think it's awesome that they included this as um, an optional buy in the campaign. I will say though, they have here six pages dedicated just to Wonder Woman. And this product description here, where is it? It says it's around 120 pages. So you're not getting every hero in here, that's for sure. Otherwise this would be a much thicker book. But they did say in the live stream today that most of the characters are in this. So I don't know, maybe Wonder Woman's special and she's the only one who gets six pages, but I think that book would need to be at least double the size if it's going to fit everybody we've seen so far. We finally unlocked Mongol, who was taking his sweet-ass time getting unlocked. Uh, that counter was really just inching, inching forward. But we finally got Mongol, who I always have seen as kind of like a diet dark side. But he, he has grown on me over the years because he's just popped up in so many things. But here's Mongol, and he's got his Black Mercy plant with him, which allows him to uh, capture heroes and allow them to stay trapped in a fantasy where they see their wildest dreams. It's kind of like the Mirror of Erised from Harry Potter. Uh, it's slowly just draining your life. So there's Mongol's dashboard. Looks like he's rocking the same color scheme as Lex Luthor. Mongol is a merciless conqueror of worlds and he will do anything to see his master plan through to conclusion. He attacks the heroes with cruelty, wailing at them repeatedly, even if there's only a single hero next to him or using his chest cannon to strike from a distance once he's under pressure. When a hero is KO'd, Mongol advances his plot by playing a face-down master plan card. Meanwhile, heroes are never able to deal more than two damage against him at a time. He's doing a lot of damage. He's a bruiser. This BAM looks like it says deal two damage to one hero in, I'm assuming, Mongol's location. Then deal two damage to one hero somewhere else. Um, that's a big deal. It'd be nice to see the rest of this, but... Two damage is a rare thing in United Villains. They really save it for the big heavy hitters. Some of them, even some, you know, like Maestro, uh, have been known to do three damage. Uh, Green Goblin as well, when he amps himself up enough. But two is still fairly rare. It's not common to see. So the fact that he does two damage and then two damage again? Wow, he's hitting hard. There's his minion, though, or his henchman, rather, Draga. And it says Mongol's threats spread the Black Mercy alien plants around, paralyzing heroes with the dreams of a perfect life so they're unable to use all their actions. When a location overflows, any heroes close to it lose an equipment or all their action tokens. Further slowing down the heroes is Mongol's henchman, Draga. The powerful warrior can crush a lonely hero, but if he's outnumbered, he'll instead set them back by removing a thug or civilian token from an incomplete mission. He will attack for two damage as well if there's only one hero there. But if there's more than one hero there or there's no heroes there, he's going to be removing stuff. So he's going to be a pain. Get rid of Draga fast when Mongols around. And Draga I actually don't remember ever seeing before. This might be my first time seeing Draga. Cool. Another comic character I get to learn about. So we got Mongol. Now we were helped. Like I said, it was a very slow inch towards getting Mongol, but we were helped. It had help from today's announced expansion. There it is right there. Gotham City, a perfect companion expansion to go alongside Metropolis. Here is Gotham City. Um, first of all, that box art, beautiful. Uh, they could have gone really dark and dreary, and they were talking about this too, uh, but they chose to splash in the color because Gotham City has, you know, all these shadowy alleys and just these dark pits of the world tucked away. But 
it's also ablaze with neon lights because that's how Gotham rolls. You usually always see it at night anyway. Um, and I do want to point out, somebody in the Facebook group pointed this out. They mentioned how if you look to the sides of the box, there are pieces of what looks like a cape here, a red and black cape of another hero that you don't see. And then on this side, another black edge that looks like it could be a cape as well. Now the person in the Facebook group theorized that maybe once we see every expansion you could put all the boxes together and it forms one giant panoramic picture which if that's what you're doing Simon oh my god that is brilliant and I am all for it. In fact I'm gonna go ahead and say please do that because <laughs> I love that idea. I think it's a safe bet we know who this red cape belongs to maybe as we'll see later but this other one here, that's a different story, but we'll get to that. So let's take a look at what's in the Gotham City expansion. Uh, if you couldn't tell from the beautiful box art right away, we have our two heroes, Nightwing and Batgirl, two very in-demand characters uh, throughout this campaign. A lot of people have been praising Nightwing as the next Nightcrawler. Like, they're just like, where is he? Where is he? Here he is. You got your Nightwing. Uh, and he comes with all his equipment, his Eskrima sticks, and Batgirl's got a couple of things as well. And a support character that we all knew was coming as soon as we learned about support characters, Alfred. And man, this makes me really happy, the idea of having an Alfred in the game. Uh, he's so important to the Batman lore that not having him would have felt weird. So that's that right there. And then, hey -oh, Purple is coming Lots of purple in this box. Well, two. That's still more purple than we've seen throughout this whole campaign. So we have two dual mode characters, a.k.a. anti-heroes, a.k.a. winky pinky poo poos, as I called them in the last video. Because you can call them whatever you want. As long as they operate like the Marvel anti-heroes, I think we are all going to be satisfied. And they have given us Red Hood and Catwoman. So they're going to be heroes and villains. I love it so much. I also love Bane as our big, big bad, literally big bad in this box. Uh, of course, Bane is red because he is not a nice person. Um, there's there's no redeeming this guy. Uh, and he comes with the usual accoutrements that the villains do. And then you have six Gotham City locations. And this cool thing here, the Bat Signal Challenge, which comes with its own token. I don't know why my voice is starting to sound like Batman as I talk about this, but there it is. And then down here we have our crowdfunding exclusives, just like with Metropolis. We've got an exclusive hero in Batwoman. Very, very cool outfit for Batwoman. And again, lots of equipment for her. And an exclusive support in Jim Gordon. Now, I think we all assumed Commissioner Gordon was going to be a playable hero because he just... He is. He's a hero. He's a hero in the Batman world. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. If Nick Fury can be a playable character, Commissioner Gordon can be a playable character. But you know what? That just means they save a space for another hero um, in the campaign. And we have the mini, so homebrewers are going to have a field day making a hero deck for Jim Gordon. You can bet your sweet behind that that's already happening in some corner of the homebrew world. Dave, Diversion Architect, get on that, buddy. Make a, a Jim Gordon hero deck and make hero decks for all the other folks uh, while you're at it, too. I want to play as Lois Lane, but uh, that's going to happen. So don't you worry about not getting a blue Gordon because it's still going to be okay. And then a quick look at what everybody does. There's my boy Alfred. I love Alfred. So he has to be played at the Wayne Manor and he is going to give action tokens to everybody. But if he dies, everybody has to play their card randomly because they're too busy mourning him. Uh, and that is true. Every time Alfred has died in any media that I've seen, it really crushes me. Uh, same with Aunt May. Alfred and Aunt May are like two sides of the same coin from different universes. Uh, and man, do we ever need an Aunt May in Marvel Season 4. Uh, all right, there's Batgirl. She has probably my favorite costume in all of the Bat family. Glad they went with the purple and yellow costume. Classic. There are her cards. She's got the martial arts training. Batgirl's a hero that relies a lot more on her brains than her brawn to take down her enemies. That's not to say she's not a formidable fighter, though, as her martial arts training grants her an attack token and the ability to evade damage. Meanwhile, her genius intellect allows her to use any action tokens as if they were a wild token, and her hacking skills grants her a heroic token and the ability to deal with threats remotely or investigate the villain to uncover their next master plan and even postpone it. 
Oh, and it talks about her gadgets right here. The Batarang attacks. The Bat Rope helps her move or pull civilians or thugs, and her Bat Cycle zooms around quickly. Looks great. Wonderful paint job. And there's Nightwing looking exactly like I imagine. Even the pose, him jumping with the Eskrima sticks. When I would fantasize about a DC United game, this is exactly the Nightwing image that I imagined we would get. Um, there's a look at some of his cards. This one here, during each villain turn, you may turn face down one of your face-up cards in the storyline to ignore the first damage he would take. Oh, well, that's cool. And he's got his sticks. He's also got two other equipment cards that we didn't get a good look at. So let's see here. Uh, so it talks about him being an expert fighter, so he doubles up on attack actions. He can even spy on the villain's master plan and use his tactical analysis to distribute action tokens. That's very Nightwing. What does it say about his things here? So his wing cycle. Okay, that gets him quickly where he needs to be. That's what this middle one is. His Nightwing suit can redirect damage to other enemies. Okay, cool. Yeah, his suit can kind of absorb, and I think it's even shocks people. And then he's got his Eskrima sticks. The Catwoman costume they picked is perfect too. There's a lot of looks that Catwoman has had. She's had the old, the Silver Age purple one. She had like the BDSM one from the movie. She had the weird Anne Hathaway one from the other movie where it's literally just black clothes and then a headband with some cat ears. Uh, I wasn't a fan of that costume. To me, when I think of Catwoman, I think of this. I think of this all black with the big eye pieces. This is exactly it. So um, they went with my favorite physical version of Catwoman. There are her cards. She's got the little jewel because she likes to steal jewels. That's her thing. She's a master thief. Take one equipment owned by another hero in your location. They gain one star token. Or if you are in a location with any civilians, you gain one star token. Then you can move. She's stealing other people's equipment and she can use it too. I think that's just so thematic. And then she's got a whip because of course she does. And I love what it does here. Use on your turn. You can punch in an adjacent location or move one thug or civilian from an adjacent location to yours. So if you have a punch action on a card and you play this, you can literally whip a thug to your spot and then knock him out, which is one of the most Catwoman things possible. Here is her dashboard. The color scheme they chose is interesting. This sort of like creamy buttery color, but uh, hey, whatever. I like it. So it looks like she is going to have a heist plan because it says here, decrease the heist plan tracker by one. Uh, it must be a tracker thing that's covered by these um, threat cards because I can't see anything here. But her BAM says if there are no heroes in Catwoman's location, something, something, increase the heist plan tracker, something, something. So she's going to be jumping around doing her heist and even her stealth is going to come into play because if there are heroes in this location when she lands there, you move her to the next clockwise location with no heroes. She's slippery. The, the Super Nintendo game was all about just chasing her for a full level. Catwoman is a slippery customer. So she's going to be robbing heroes, which she can use their equipment for herself, and hiding among thugs to avoid damage. That's so cool. Uh, so that's her, her heroic thing is being tricky and roguelike. And then as a villain, Catwoman is attempting to pull the ultimate heist. This turns into a literal game of cat and mouse, except the heroes are the cat and Catwoman is a mouse, as she advances on her plan track whenever she manages to bam without a hero in her location to thwart her. Oh, that's interesting. If she bams and there's no hero in her location, yeah, like it says here, she puts the, the heist tracker up. So that's where these stealth cards are going to help her, because if she lands here and there's a hero, she has to do this effect first before she bams, because that's how the master plan cards go. Ah, very interesting. I like that. And then Jason Todd is the next anti-hero. I will admit he is my least favorite member of the Bat family. Uh, I just, as a storyteller, I hate the idea of dead characters coming back. I, it always irked me. It always annoyed me. And I get it. That's comic books. Everybody comes back. I understand. But I always loved the idea that there was a Robin who died and that really messed up Batman, and it kind of changed the way he thought about having sidekicks from then on. So just to bring him back and be like, I'm back, and now I'm just mad all the time, it, it didn't really do it for me. But I know a lot of people love Red Hood, so I'm not going to be complaining. I think there's a typo on his cards, because his name is supposed to be two words, but his hero cards here say Red Hood as one thing. So we might need to spell check some of that, but it's okay. It's early days, baby. So he's got dual sidearms, which lets him do two punches against a single target in his or an adjacent location, then punch in an adjacent location. Red Hood is the Raphael of the Bat family. He's all about punching and dealing damage and being emo and angry and standing on rooftops and wearing red. He's going to have a lot of aggressive cards. We can already tell. He's got a couple of equipment cards as well. And there is his dashboard. I love me some villain dashboards. He's going to be doing vigilante stuff. 
So kind of similar to what we see in Multiverse with Cosmic Ghost Rider. And when I say we, I mean people in Asia and Oceania who have gotten the game. Because over here in North America and Canada, we're still waiting for it, see? I don't know why I turned into the 1930s there, I apologize. But uh, there's Red Hood's dashboard. Um, he's going to be taking out villains. Uh, and there's some interesting things that they said here. So let's take a look. So it says as a hero, he's a ruthless vigilante. Yep, he's opening fire on enemies, whether they're near or far, using the dim Mac pressure points technique to stun any villain or henchman. Uh, and also because he was immersed in the Lazarus pits, it gifted him with magic negation, allowing him to avoid crisis tokens. So thematic, just an extra little thing that they added. I love it. What does he have? He's got his costume that absorbs damage and his all blades are perfect for mowing down a posse of henchmen. So that's uh, the other equipment is his costume. So as a villain, Red Hood takes his lethal methods of crime fighting too far and it's up to the heroes to stop him before his vigilante track reaches the end. I'm not going to go over all of that, but I want to take a look because I love whenever they show off henchmen in the art, right? Um, among these criminals, Black Mask turns civilians into thugs and sets them against the heroes. Cheshire evades heroes and makes surprise attacks. That's her. Crime Doctor. <laughs> I like his glasses. Crime Doctor heals himself and other nearby henchmen. Ooh, annoying. And El Flamingo. El Flamingo fills the streets with... Thugs. There are a couple others that we better keep under wraps for now. Heyo, oh, now that is a big old red flag, but not in a bad way. What's the opposite of a red flag? A blue flag? That's a blue flag. It's a checkered flag because it makes me want to go. So we have two other henchmen cards, or two other threat cards rather, that are going to be part of his uh, his deck that he's going to be trying to stop. Because they're keeping them under wraps, I am assuming that means it's because they are going to be playable villains. As much as we love having every character ever at our disposal, we would probably be disappointed if the next stretch goal was Crime Doctor or Cheshire or El Flamingo, right? We, we don't really care about seeing those guys as much. Uh, Condiment King, on the other hand, he's top shelf. But the other two they're keeping under wraps, which means they want to save them for a big surprise. So I think, I don't want to jinx it, but I think my boy Riddler might be waiting in the wings. And man, does that ever get me excited. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And speaking of bad people, here is Bane with his gigantic miniature with all those tubes. I want to see his bam, but I can't. Ah! Can't see the bam. Special rules. KO. Draw master playing card. All right, so he's just burning cards. He's got uh, his threats as well as his henchman, the white rabbit, who deals one damage to one hero in this location, then add one thug to each adjacent location. His master playing cards are constantly pumping himself up with his venom serum in the form of crisis tokens. Ah, okay. His regular attacks already damage all heroes in his location, but if he's full of venom, he deals out damage all around him for each token he has. Oh no. His health is prodigious, and to make matters worse, the healing venom may recover some of it when he's close to being defeated. Yeah, he does have a lot of health. Oh man, yeah, that's very, very Bane. Andrea talked about how complicated Bane was. In fact, he dropped an F-bomb because he said Bane was such a pain. He's got tough thugs that must be defeated one by one and that supply Bane with more venom tokens. He also has a couple henchmen, including White Rabbit, who gets more thugs to follow her. Interesting. She's the only henchman we see. So are they keeping somebody else under wraps? Um, that's a question for the comic book people. Is anybody known to work with Bane who's kind of a big enough name that they would want to keep them secret? I don't know. Uh, and there are the locations. We have Wayne Manor, Crime Alley, Wayne Tower, The Narrows, Gotham City Hall, and Gotham Clock Tower, which has a very powerful end of turn feature. If you completed one or more mission cards and then you end your turn here on the same turn that you complete a mission card, you can delay the next villain turn. That's going to be used and abused a lot, I can already tell. But it is tricky enough to pull off that it, it won't break the game. And there's the Bat Signal Challenge. When playing with the Bat Signal Challenge, at the end of each villain turn, a new Bat Signal card is revealed, unless one is already in play. Each of these five cards places the Bat Signal token in a location with specific characteristics, adds an ongoing effect to the game, and sets a condition the heroes must fulfill in order to discard the card and shut off the bat signal. Maybe a big robbery is taking place, forcing the heroes to take out all thugs in its location. Or a specific threat becomes a priority, so no other threat can be cleared until the heroes have dealt with it. No situation is so bad that it can't get worse when the bat symbol looms over Gotham City's dark skies. I love it. And then as we go down here, we see Batwoman. It's the Catherine Kane version. I think there's also a Cassandra Kane Batwoman. 
Um, I'm, my knowledge of Batwoman is a little bit limited. I'm sorry. I know much more about Batgirl. Bat I haven't even seen the mystery of the Batwoman movie, and I've been dying to, but it's hard to find. So she has acrobatics. She can treat all moves as punches and vice versa. That's awesome. She also has six, count them, six equipment cards, including uh, these battering thorns, a first aid kit, some poison control things, antidotes. So just like Batman, she's going to be well equipped. Uh, you can plan ahead when you pick her as a hero and really make sure you are best ready to deal with whoever you have to fight. And then there's Commissioner Gordon and his card and his miniature. And it says Commissioner Gordon is going to, let's see, he starts at any location containing civilians. And during their turn, heroes can spend an action to send him to any location besieged by thugs so he can eliminate one of them, no matter how tough they may be. Oh, cool. So even if they're like Chitari thugs, he can take them out. Now, I wonder if doing that counts towards defeating thugs, the mission, or if it just removes it from the game, because those are two different things. There's uh, defeating a thug and removing a thug. Defeating is better because it gets your mission tracker going up, um, but that might make him overpowered. So maybe he just removes it and prevents overflow. And overflows are bad because if his location overflows, he is killed and removed from the game. So sad. Oh, man. Now, that obviously was the catalyst to rocket us through a couple of other stretch goals, including Mongol. And then we got to this handsome gent, the question. Oh, my God, I love this dude. I can't state enough how much I love the question. In fact, I think he was one of my top 10 most uh, anticipated wishlist characters for DC Superheroes United. Uh, the video that I made uh, about a few days before the campaign started. I'm pretty sure I had question in my top 10. I'm going to have to go back and recheck, but I think I did. Oh, man, he's, I just love how he's just this little weirdo with no face running around solving conspiracy theories and saying things like, You're not asking the right questions. Think outside the box. I love this dude. Uh, there, right there, his, his card says, asking the right questions, gain as many heroic and or punch tokens as the corresponding symbols at the bottom of the previous hero card in the storyline. Now, they have him perched on this uh, pillar here. I think it would have been cool if his uh, miniature was surrounded by smoke because uh, he's got that gas, but it's okay. All the better to see his clear lack of face. That's wicked. So through his investigative skills, he not only reveals the next master plan card, but also gains move heroic action tokens like we saw. He may also inquire other heroes, gaining action tokens according to the previous card in this. Oh, that's what we saw. All right. So surrounded by binary gas, the question is able to tail the villain following their every step while avoiding their bam. That's a very handy thing to have. That looks like the binary gas card there, but we can't quite make it out. Something, something villain moves, blah, 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 blah. You can move to blah, 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 that turn. We'll get a better look at these sooner or later. But question was unlocked thanks to Gotham. Next up is Talia al Ghul. And I said, when we saw Ra's al Ghul, I said, I really hope we see Talia as well because she's a big deal. I thought she was going to be purple, but this game is very, very picky on who it makes purple. Uh, so unfortunately, she's just red. We can't play as her. But there she is. There's Talia. Her beautiful, uh, what is that, aquamarine colored dashboard and she not only comes with a figure not only comes with 12 master playing cards and a villain dashboard and six threat cards but she comes with a rules reference card because we have our first villain gauntlet of the campaign and that is this behead the demon uh we'll talk about that in a second here so in spite of her past relationship with batman talia al ghul is ever the more committed to fulfilling her father's vision executing a plan that will put a lot of pressure on any hero trying to stop her most of her master plan cards reveal an agenda she's trying to complete if the next hero to play is able to perform specific tasks outlined on the agenda on that very same turn they manage to stop it otherwise that agenda is complete if talia is allowed to complete four of her agendas the league of assassins plan is fulfilled oh boy so let's see if we can see one of these agendas protect the organization add one crisis token to this card if at least two damage are dealt in a single to a single henchman or to talia al ghul during the next hero turn remove the crisis token from this card every one of her master plan cards these agendas is kind of like an ultimatum and on the next hero turn you have to fulfill that so woe to the hero who has to follow directly after Talia al Ghul. Uh, this is a game where you might not want to be the hero who goes first, unless you're pretty confident in your hand of cards. So cool. And there are her henchmen. I love seeing henchmen. Leviathan, a.k.a. Mark Shaw. 
the heretic, and Nissa al Ghul. And I remember Nissa from the Arkham games, so it's nice to see her back. Talia strikes from the shadows, stabbing heroes with a poisoned blade. Ew! Oh no! That may weaken their attacks against her, otherwise she's constantly spreading her thugs around and using them to attack the heroes when there's an overflow. Half her threats bring assassin techniques that hinder heroes trying to defeat thugs, rescue civilians, or even move around. The other half bring her deadly henchmen. Leviathan, who I'm pretty sure is this guy, accelerates the master plan and neutralizes hero abilities. The heretic can strike anywhere around him and is constantly regenerating. Ah, uh, I hate when bad guys heal. And Nissa Al Ghul converts civilians into thugs if there are no heroes to attack. And then here is her new game mode here. Using Behead the Demon rules, players can choose to play back-to-back -back games, first against Talia Al Ghul and then against her father, Raish Al Ghul, with their performance in the first game bringing consequences to the final encounter. Depending on which agendas Talia was allowed to complete, Raish's setup will be a little different, with civilians being discarded or turned into thugs. That's awesome! Henchmen gaining extra health or the destroy evil track starting already in progress. Plus, any hero that was poisoned by Talia's blade loses a card. Let me tell you the reason why I love these villain gauntlets so much. So, as I open this up here, here's a peek behind the curtain to how I play United. So far right now, it's just Marvel, because DC does not really exist yet. So, I have a Word file here, I have a Word document that is just all the characters I own in Marvel United, which is almost everybody, minus two expansion boxes. And I have them listed out here in alphabetical order, and they are numbered as well in chunks of 10, just to make it easier for me to read. So as you can see here, as I go all the way down, 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 uh, I have 143 heroes, and then here are the bad guys, and I have 70 of those. And then I also keep track of what days I play and who I played with and whether I won or lost. Uh, it's, it's very fun. <laughs> it's nerdy, but very fun. So anyway, when I am playing, whenever I set up a game, I use a random number generator and I pick my three heroes. I just do, you know, I spin a random wheel and if it says, hey, the number you got was 102, I come up here and I look, okay, there's 100 plus 1, 2, and hey, it's Rogue. I gotta love Rogue, right? So she would be the first hero and I would pick three heroes and then I would do the same thing for the villains. I would set a, a number wheel up to 70 spin the wheel, and then whoever it lands on, let's say number 30, there's my boy Kingpin. That's who I would end up playing as uh, uh, the villain for that game. So that's how I set up whenever I play Marvel United. Now, the reason why I love those villain gauntlet so much is because of this setup. So as you can see here, one of the things I have listed here is the Infinity Gauntlet. Okay, in fact, it's right underneath the homebrew hydro man that i made with the meeple monkey uh but i have the infinity gauntlet right here on my list so if i spin that number wheel and i get let's see 26 1 2 3 4 5 6 yeah that means that game that i'm about to play is going to be an infinity gauntlet game what that does for me why that you know tickles my my brain in a good way so much is because i have on this list thanos there's Thanos. And I also have each of his Black Order. There's Proxima Midnight, and you can see the other ones that are around. There's Corvus Glaive, right? So I added the Infinity Gauntlet challenge as an extra villain because that's really what it is at the end of the day. Same with the Sinister Six, right? I have each of them individually. There's Sandman, for example. But if I spin the number 60, hey, I'm playing against the Sinister Six for that game right? So not only does each villain have a spot, a number on the list, but these big villain modes like Sinister Six, like Infinity Gauntlet, they have numbers on the list too. And when season three eventually gets here, the Heralds of Galactus are going to go on this list right here above Hydro Man. And also each of those four Heralds are going to get a spot on the list. And also Galactus himself is going to get a spot on the list. So in total, that box is going to give me one for Galactus, one for each of the Heralds, and one for the Heralds of Galactus mode, that's going to give me six villain options that I can add to my list of villain options. And I want these lists to be as plentiful as possible because the more the merrier. So right now I have 70. And when season three comes, I will probably have close to 150. I haven't done the math. That's why I love those gauntlets because it makes this list even bigger. It makes the variety even more flavorful. And with DC United finally throwing that in, if I get DC United, because again, I'm I'm really still struggling to see if I can scrape together the cash to do so. But if I get DC United, um, what was that? 
thing called the Demon's Head, whatever, you know, I would put Ra's al Ghul on the list. I would put Tali al Ghul on the list. And then I would just come over here and put, you know, Demon's Head on the list. And that would become a villain mode unto itself. And I love that. I love having that variety. It makes the game just so pleasurable to my uh, my nerdy brain to have this list here to refer to every time I play. And that, as they say, is that for now. Uh, we have another very busy week to look forward to uh, ahead of us. Now, I'm going to be back at a rigorous work schedule next week, so I will see how much coverage I can do. It's definitely going to be a little bit different than what I was able to do this week, but we will play that by ear. I will definitely be getting videos to you throughout the week regardless. They just may take different forms or come out at different times, such as the nature of things. But I promise you can continue to come right here to Digital Charcuterie as we continue to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. So until then, buy my books. We were wizards on Amazon right now, and I will see you next time for whatever comes next in the master plan. Ciao for now.